We are starting the um, series, uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount, and today will be the first of the three parts of uh, sermon. And I would like to invite you to open the Word of God to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And uh, this morning I will be reading from the King James Version, uh, starting from verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. May God, <clears throat> May God bless the reading. So the Sermon on the Mount is found in two um, books, uh, synoptic books in the New Testament. And the first one is, or I should say the Sermon on the Mount is found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, to chapter 8, verse 1. This Sermon on the Mount could be also found in Luke chapter 6, verses 17 to 49. And verse 1 starts like this, And seeing the multitudes, uh, it says, He went up into a mountain. So here apparently the great multitude of chapter 4, verse 25, that followed Jesus after his first major missionary tour through the cities and villages of Galilee. So, this incident took place in the late summer of the year AD 29. So, many theologians will agree that Jesus was baptized in the year 27 AD. 27 AD. Um, and uh, the when Simon Peter uh, met Jesus, it was either late fall or early winter of um, year 27. Um, so this is the incident that is taking place, um, passing the, the mid-mark of Jesus' three and a half years of earthly ministry. So almost close to having completed two years of his earthly ministry. So right now, people are hearing about him, and now there is a great following of Jesus. So what happened preceding to this very event is that Jesus had his first missionary trip in Galilee. So he went through the cities and towns and villages, and he was healing people, and now as people heard what Jesus was doing, now start, they started to follow Jesus, saying, this must be the Messiah that we've been waiting for. So we know that Simon was given the name Cephas or Peter in the late fall or early winter of AD 27. But I preached about it, how Simon and some of the disciples became a complete and fully committed followers of Jesus, not in the year 27, AD 27, but rather in the spring of 8027. So this incident is taking place in the late summer, but it was only in the spring that Simon Peter and some of the disciples became full, uh, full follower of Jesus. Before then, what happened? We know that eight of them, according to the tradition, were fishermen, and two of them were salesmen, and one was a tax collector. 
All of them came from the vicinity of Galilee. The only person who came from other town, if I may, actually came from Jerusalem, a prestigious location where everyone wanted to live, was Judas Iscariot. But the rest, 11, were coming from a humble background. And that, um, but what they were doing until the spring of 8029, spring of 8029 is they were going back and forth. Time to time, they will go, try to go back and try to catch fish or try to go back and, and sell whatever that they were selling before. Only when Jesus came and performed miracles for them, the miracle that is described in Matthew chapter 4, Mark chapter 1, and Luke chapter 5, uh, catching of much fish, only then when Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, they started a what? They became a full-time follower of Jesus. Obviously, if you're a fisherman, it seems like it makes sense. It seems like it's a good business arrangement. If Jesus can catch fish like that, why would you want to waste your time trying to catch fish all night? All you have to do is follow Jesus, right? Because he will perform the miracles. So now as he was following, Jesus engaged in his first uh, missionary journey in the Galilee, at the, at the vicinity of Galilee. So disciples were there. And now in the summer, in the summer, Jesus is saying to the disciples now, the group is growing, and now I will be sending you in my name. You go in my name. And so from a disciple, um, original word would it, will be disciples, uh, disciples, which means a follower or learner. Now they've become apostles. Apostello, that is the word where the word apostle is driven from. Apo means for, stello is being sent away. So what I'm trying to is say to you here is that when they became a full-time full follower, in a matter of six months, Jesus made them what? Jesus sent them away with the message for them to share the good news. But just before Jesus did, is this experience of the disciples. What, what Jesus is doing is that According to, you know, reading of the passages, when you compare the Luke and Matthew, you will find out Jesus spent entire night in prayer. It seems like whenever there was a major event that was to take place, Jesus spent all night praying. So in this particular instance also, Jesus was praying all night. And in the morning, Jesus ordained the twelve. He set them apart. He laid his hand on them. I don't know what was the form of ordination then, but he anointed them to become apostles. And he sent to them a go. And then what, what he did with disciples, they descend to the seashore. But then what happened? There were so many people. They had to move away because there was not enough space for everyone to be. So Jesus said, follow me. And he went to the hill, to the mount, to the mount. And there he preached this sermon. And the sermon is known today to us as what? The Sermon on the Mount. Okay? So when the multitude gathered, they realized this is no... Uh, ordinary uh, speech that Jesus was about to do. There was a feeling that something more than usual might be expected here. They now pressed about their master. They're all eager to hear what he's going to say. They believe that the kingdom was soon to be established because they start to recognize that Jesus you know, was the Messiah. And from the events of the morning, they gather assurance that some announcement concerning it was about to be made, right? So when Jesus said to the apostles, I'm ordaining you, maybe they took that as they are being assigned to a uh, special positions in his, Jesus' cabinet. A feeling of expectancy pervaded the multitude also, and eager faces gave evidence of the deep interest. As the people sat upon the green hillside awaiting the words of the divine, um, you know, of the divine teacher, um, their hearts were filled with thoughts of future glory. They were all anticipating this teacher to tell us how they will be delivered from the hands of hated Romans and how their riches and their possessions will be given to um, the Jews. 
and how their uh, kingdom will be established and Jesus will become the earthly king. There were poor peasants and fishermen there and they were hoping to hear how their, their lives will drastically improve because Jesus had a, a promise, you know. We, we hear those campaigns, don't we not? You know, every four years uh, you hear the politicians of this world trying to tell us how during his watch or her watch we will have the most beautiful four years or whatever. Only to be disappointed, those are earthly promises. But here they were anticipating this rising ruler, the Messiah, who they are sure who would deliver them from the hands of Romans. With great anticipation, they are trying to capture every word that was coming from the mouth of Jesus, right? And then Jesus opens his mouth. He sat down, and this was the custom how the rabbis will sit and uh, thank you pastor rutsko for kind of giving us the flavor of uh, the jewish way of service the, the the lyrics is beautiful um and the the rabbis will sit down and the students will sit at the rabbi's feet so when we hear by the way when we hear um, mary magdalene was at the feet of jesus it is not just saying that she was physically at the feet of Jesus, but in the statement, uh, there is the implication or implying of the fact that they were learning from Jesus. So Mary Magdalene was not just simply, she would enjoy sitting in front of Jesus, but you know, she enjoyed learning from Jesus. But what Jesus did though is that she con he continued to mentor the disciples so even if there were hundreds and thousands of people, there was a special space for the 12 disciples. And those disciples made sure that they will be close to Jesus you know, at his feet. And now verse 4, 2. Now Jesus opened his mouth. Jesus opened his mouth. And then the first thing that he says is what? Blessed. Blessed. Okay, the, the eight Beatitudes starts with the word blessed. It is coming from the Greek word makarioi, uh, and singular is makarios. And actually, this word makarioi or makarios is translated as happy. Happy. Blessed means happy are thou. You know, sometimes we wonder why we do what we do. In fact, I believe that when God created, He created in us the desire to be happy. Do you wish to be happy? Right? Do you think God wants us to be happy? Right? So here, blessed, when He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, He's saying, happy are the poor in spirit. By the way, where did the word beatitude come from? In fact, in Latin, this word is translated as uh, beatitudo, beatitudo. And so the Vergate, the Latin Vergate Bible, when it's speaking of each beatitude, it starts with beati, B-A-T-I. And this is the reason why we call them beatitudes, the eight beatitudes. So now I want you to imagine people who are living a humble life, and when I say humble life, I'm talking about the life that you and I, we live. The life that is filled with the ordinary experiences. What are the ordinary experiences? That you have to worry about, you know, making bread or, or, or bringing bread to the table. You have to pay the bills, you know. If you're a fisherman, you worry about catching fish. You're peasants, you have different worries. Do we not have those worries that comes with... Um, you know, the, 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 the life that we live. So there are simple people like us, you know, we worry about tomorrow, what we will eat, what we'll wear, where we will sleep, 
whether we're going to have a retirement savings or not. You know, it's a common thing. There's nothing wrong with that, meaning that we are living in this uh, the dire world where there are many needs, and emotional and physical and psychological, all kinds of needs. And they're all sitting in front of Jesus, like hoping that Jesus will tell them or show them his plan in making all of them happy. You know, why do you think they were following Jesus? So that they will be unhappy? No, they were following Jesus because Jesus was healing them. And this is the reason why I believe following Jesus' experience should be filled with joy and happiness. Amen? And part of it, coming to church should be uh, not something that you dread, but it's something that you look forward to. How can you not look forward to when you have praises being sang, the words are being spoken, you know, you hear this beautiful Russian song, you know? This is what we're going to miss. You know, time to time after uh, the first service, I will linger and through the speaker I hear this Russian, and I'm going to miss. Maybe one day I will come and we will have a joint service with Source of Life. Maybe we should do that, Pastor. But anyways, people were sitting there with great anticipation and expectation that Jesus would say something really incredible. And then he points out that what? Hey, by the way, you know, you are happy if you are poor in spirit. Isn't that paradoxical? It doesn't, it seems like those two words don't go together. Poor, how can you be poor and happy at the same time? Happiness is not associated with being poor. But he is talking about dip different kinds of poverty here. In fact, he's talking about what? Spiritual poverty. If you have a spiritual poverty, good for you. Because what? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you have a spiritual poverty, the word poverty here, poor, is from the Greek word, you know, putochos. It indicates a deep poverty. It, you know, the word means to crouch, to cower. Like you're like, you know, in, in deep poverty. And Jesus is saying that if you have a spiritual poverty, okay, he's not talking about, you know, how much you have in the bank, whether you caught fish yesterday or not. But he's saying if you have a spiritual poverty, poverty. If you are poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Jews conceive of the kingdom of heaven as a kingdom based on force that would compel the nations of earth to submit to Israel. But the kingdom Christ came to establish was one that begins within man's hearts. Isn't that interesting? In fact, theologians will say that the Sermon on the Mount is actually his inaugural speech. As uh, the disciples became the first charter members of his kingdom, because where king is, is the kingdom. Amen? He was already the king of kings and the lord of lords. He doesn't need the position uh, of being an earthly king in order for him to get the title. He's already the king of kings and the war, the the Lord of Lords, right? He is king. So wherever he is present, that's the kingdom. And because Jesus was here, that kingdom experience should be felt in our hearts today. Because we are part of God's kingdom. Amen? Amen? So Jewish consider that satisfaction, that contentment uh, from some other source being delivered from the oppression of the Romans. You know, perhaps, you know, to equate to today's experience that you don't have to worry about the bills that you would need to pay. You don't have to worry about the job security. You don't have to worry about your fish and your crops and whatever. But that Jesus is speaking of a, a different experience that they should be engaging themselves in, which is what? You know, do you sense your spiritual impoverishment? Do you sense the need of deep spiritual connectedness? You know, I hope you do. That you yearn for the spiritual feeling that you are so anxious to go back to church because you are looking for that feeling that can only come from the source of power. Amen? 
This was his first word. Christ's first words to the people on the mount were words of blessing. Everyone, they were like me, full of worries and full of stresses and whatnot. And Jesus started out by saying, happy are you. Because there were people who were poor in spirit. He's saying, you are blessed, you are happy. You may not have this, you may not have that, but you are blessed and you are happy because what? Yours is the kingdom of heaven. And he goes furthermore, and then he goes to verse 4 and said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You know, who wants to mourn? Do you enjoy mourning? You know, um, I've been here now over a year, and thankfully the members are opening up to me. And so I have times where I spend... Uh, time with members and they share their concerns and their worries and and I, I realize that we all need each other amen we all need each other and I look forward to uh, having those times moments with you where we can talk about the things that we mourn about the things that we mourn about but sometimes we look at the mourning as a simply a negative experience. And we often ask, why is God causing me to mourn? Shouldn't I be happy all the time? But here is one quote that I want to share with you. This is from the Desire of Ages. And for those also who mourn in trial and sorrow, there is comfort. In other words, when you are mourning... You will feel the comforting presence of God. In other words, if you're in need, God will feel that need. If you are self-sufficient, there is no need for God. But if you are in need because you lost your loved ones, because you lost your job, because your health was compromised, and because of the life's challenges that you're going through, you are grieving and mourning, rest assured, there will be the comforter who will be next to you, carrying the burdens with you, walking next to you side by side. You know, isn't this interesting that uh, as they are thinking how you and I would think that Christ, as he is doing his inaugural speech, he's saying, my kingdom is different. What you will experience in my kingdom is different than what you are experiencing in this oppressed world. You know, I pray that we'll have the spiritual discernment to know that, you know what, we're not so comfortable in the kingdom that we are living, the world that we're living, but we will await with great anticipation for the kingdom that is to come and the kingdom that is in Christ. And he said, blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted. And then he goes further, blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. There were people who were poor. There were people who were persecuted. There were people who were meek. In fact, these days, meekness is not considered as a character trait that will cause you to succeed. In fact, I remember telling some young people that you need to emulate confidence. Okay? The society that we live in, you have to have persona. You have to have a facade, right? You need to act as if you know what you're doing. You need to have that confidence so that people will say, oh, if he's that confidence, he must know what he's doing. It's more of a show rather than the substance. But the Moses leadership is portrayed as meekness, humility, the meekness. But as they are thinking of their own way of thinking, how their king should look like, Jesus is introducing a concept of his heavenly kingdom that is so different than what they're used to and yet it is so transcending and uplifting you know blessed are the pure in heart sorry blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy blessed are the pure in heart for they will see god blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called sons of god 
Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Because of there is a repeat of the word blessed, some people think there are nine B attitudes, but verse 10 and 11, they're talking about the same thing. So there are eight B attitudes. Because we don't have much time, and we would like to have some special recognition of the Shalom Church and the pastor. And I would like to summarize, but this is how one translation puts it. And this is how this one translation puts it. By the way, thank you, Dr. Ken. Um, I appreciated uh, your message last week. Free Bible Version translates this way. Blessed are those who recognize they are spiritually poor. Do you recognize your spiritual poverty? Are you poor? I hope you are. That you feel the spiritual poverty that you want the feeling. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who are kind, for they will, be, will own the whole world. Blessed are those whose greatest desire is to do what is right, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are those who have pure minds, for they will see God. Blessed are those who work to bring peace, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those persecuted for what is right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and accuse you of all kinds of evil things because of me. Be glad, be really glad, for you will receive a great reward in heaven. For they persecuted the prophets who came before you in just the same way. And you know what verse comes after that? He said, you shall be salt to the world. You shall be light to the world. He's saying, my, my kingdom is different. If you're coming here with your own dreams, own idea of your happiness. You're coming here that you will be delivered from the oppression of the Romans. If you're coming here thinking that you don't have to catch fish anymore. If you're coming here as peasants so that you will have some clothing. And if you're coming here for those earthly needs, let me remind you that my kingdom experience is not like that. It is so transcendent and it's so inspiring that it will give you the inner satisfaction, the inner contentment that you cannot find anywhere else. And Jesus is saying, do you recognize it, that you're in need? If you are in need of it, you are blessed. You know, the title of the sermon is The Beatitude, but if you look at the program, it says, to be attitude, right? So I thought that maybe I can use the sermon title and apply what we just learned. And I speak to you and I appeal to you. Be poor. Be poor. Be poor in spirit. I hope that you will have the spiritual, you know, uh, the sense of spiritual poverty that what? That you will inherit kingdom of heaven. I pray that you will mourn. I challenge you to mourn so that what? That you will be comforted. In your suffering will be the comforting support of Jesus. I challenge you to be meek because you will inherit the earth. I pray that you will be hungry and thirsty for righteousness because your desire to be righteousness, righteous in Christ it will give you that satisfaction. It can only come from being right with God. And I'll say that be merciful because in return, you will receive that mercy from others. I say that you will have pure in pure, you know, you will have purity, you, know, you be pure in heart. Why? Because in that purity, you will see God, His own face. 
I know actually someone who prayed that God will reveal his face to him. And actually Jesus appeared himself to him. Anyway, I have a one sermon I'm preparing. I asked the guy, what was the nationality of Jesus? I said, what was the ethnicity of Jesus? And if you find out what he told me, what Jesus' ethnicity was, you will be very surprised. But I'm going to leave it hanging right there. Okay, I'm not going to keep you hanging. He said he was Korean. <laughs> why? Because he was Korean. If he doesn't know anyone better, why would God show up as a Arabs? If they only knew Korean, anyway. I pray that you will be a peacemaker. That you will be called as sons of God. I will pray that you will be persecuted for righteous sake. Because at the end of that persecution will be the kingdom of God. What God successfully did at the mount, as he was talking about the Sermon on the Mount, starting with the Beatitude, he was telling all of us how we must prepare ourselves to be the heavenly kingdom's citizens. And it is my prayer that this kingdom experience will continue in our walk with Jesus. By the way, I want to just recognize some of those people who are visiting us for the first time. It's so good that you're here. I'm not going to put you on the spot or embarrass you by calling out your name, so you know. It is so good to have you. And I pray this God's happiness, His blessings, as we talked about here, will be filled in your heart.